Hi, everybody. So Game of Thrones is back. And I guess so am I. Mm. This was a good first episode by House of the Dragon. And I think I might just post uh, reviews here after every episode. You know, as long as it's good. And let me know if you want me to do that by either clicking the like button or letting me know in the comments. So let's get right to it. The first thing I wondered as I was watching the episode is what is this show about? What is it really about? I mean, I know there are houses and dragons and Westeros. I know that. But what is it actually about? In the same way that Game of Thrones was in many ways actually about the patriarchy preventing women from taking part in leadership positions. And as I was watching the, the trailers for House of the Dragon, I thought to myself, is this going to be the same story again about female leadership just 172 years earlier? Thankfully, it is not. <laughs> the first episode was very, very promising. And since every story has to be relevant to the time it is published, even if it's based on source material from 10 years ago, it has to be about something relevant today. And I think that the House of the Dragon is actually about two entrenched political factions or political parties disconnected from the reality of the people they rule, focused either on their personal ambitions or just focusing on playing the political game. Both of them are morally corrupt. One of them is much worse than the other, though. The lesser of the two evils, that's the political faction of the king. He is an aging ruler whose life has been plagued by family tragedies. In that way, he's a very sympathetic ruler. He has by his side the hand of the king functioning as sort of the deep state. On the other hand, <laughs> the worst of the two evils, that political faction is led by a fascist troll, a snarky man-baby who appeals to the masses even though he's just as morally corrupt as the other elites. He's playing the victim card. Oh, this should have been mine. This should have been mine. And he's very proud of telling stuff like it is, as if this is some moral virtue. So this is what I think the show will be mainly about, or at least partly about. Okay, so let's uh, go back a little bit. So the aging ruler is King Viserys I. The fascist troll is Daemon Targaryen. The first thing he does when he's given just a little bit of power is abuse it. He's taking the cops with him and he just starts smashing heads, cutting off hands or worse. His view of ruling is oppressing. This is how he sees power. His goal is that the people fear him. But he's not condescending. No, 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 no. He's playing it as if he's just like a man of the people there. He, has, he goes to a bar and he turns it into some kind of rally, <laughs> a political rally, giving a speech. <laughs> and he scolds the other elites that they haven't been outside the Red Keep as if what he's doing is being a man of the people. Yeah, 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 sure. Everybody else uh, has a golden dragon too, right? And he's always whining about how things are unfair. People have been very unfair towards him. Oh, his, his brother should have done more for him. He obviously doesn't think about what he should have done differently. No, ever. Now, just another spoiled elite 
born with a silver spoon up his ass and thinks he's amazing just because he was born. But since he doesn't have a lot of political power, then he's on the opposite end of the deep state that I mentioned, Otto Hightower. He has spies everywhere. He knows how to operate the machine. He's been there for a very, very long time. All the ministers, they've all been there for a very, very long time. You can't replace them. Are they doing a good job? No. The other guy, though, wants to do a worse job. That's the only thing that we can say to the credit of the deep state. Another thing that I thought the episode was about, that was interesting because this is 170 years before the events that we know. I feel like this show is also about how you are trapped in your own period, in your own historical period. We know what is going to happen. There's going to be a civil war. Those two political uh, parties are going to fight against, against each other. Both of them have nukes. And the way that the episode was set up is basically w- civil war is inevitable. Even though they have to be united in order to prepare for the climate disaster that is coming. No one person can redirect this ship. It's just too big and everybody's just thinking about the next move. What's the next move? So they are trapped in that period of time. What is coming is inevitable. This is also in the genre of prequels, like Better Call Saul. The conclusion is already written. Now the only question is how we are going to get there. So this is a good thing for this show. Spoilers are not going to be a big thing. I really like that. I think we're tired with amazing twists. No, just we want a good story. This looks like a good story. And I think the theme of being trapped in your own period in time is interesting for us now. If you're listening to to this, then you went through financial crisis, wars in all kinds of places in the world, a global pandemic, climate disasters looming. They're here and they're looming. We know all this. We know what is going to happen (laughs) in the future. (laughs) Just as, as viewers watching the House of the Dragon. But... We are powerless to stop it, as if we are living (laughs) in some prequel. And we have no agency and no way of affecting the events. Somebody else is writing the events. (laughs) At least the people writing the events in House of the Dragon, they write them well. I really liked how immediately at the beginning, they already sent you some liminal messages that this is Game of Thrones, but just like... So much better. A few shots at the beginning are just with the dragon, just like the famous shots from when Daenerys uh, burned King's Landing. And then immediately we go to a council. And that is so different from the council at the final episode of Game of Thrones that was just like people on chairs with, you know, uh, water bottles and just like silly and stupid. Here is a council, a giant council rituals of how they speak they put the ball inside some bowl or something just everything tells you also the the iron throne that this is going to be a lot more realistic than the previous one and the pace is different this is very slow in the best way possible this is not about what's going to happen next i think also the way that they speak valerian is also also goes to, to tell us that this is going to be more realistic. At the end, she didn't say Dracaris. She said Dracaris in some uh, proto-Italian accent or something. When we start this story, basically the empire has grown too comfortable, soft, and you have all these 
old rules and traditions that are not conducive for their day and age. They were written, laws that were written centuries ago. But it's very, very hard to change them. And when you have fascist trolls who's driven by ambition for power, for power's sake, these kind of people always use all the means necessary, legal or illegal. They will claim both sides of any argument as long as it suits them. And unless you prepare for this fascist threat, then civil war is coming. Another theme of the show, I think, will be history repeating itself. Does it repeat itself? Does it rhyme? A council again? Factions again? Prophecies again? A female ruler again? Can we escape what history has predetermined for us? The characters cannot, because their history has already been written. So I'm kind of looking forward uh, to watching the rest uh, of the season. So my favorite scene of the whole episode was weird. When Damon Targaryen was with his uh, prostitute or girlfriend or whatever it is. And their intimacy. I really like that. Because he's such a hard and harsh and distant character with everybody else. And with all, you know, the pomp of a prince in a royal court. Everybody's keeping, you know, six feet (laughs) from each other as if this is a pandemic. (laughs) And then suddenly you see this uh, regular non-royal woman just come up to him so naturally and just like embrace him tenderly and naturally. And he lets her. This was like, oh, that was very nice. I like that. Okay, so that's it for this one. And since we're already here, let me tell you about uh, my two podcasts. I have a podcast called A Podcast of Biblical Proportions that is about the stories and the writers of the Hebrew Bible. I'm going story by story and I'm trying to hunt for the people who wrote each and every story. Either a specific person with a name We know when and where he lived, or maybe a faction that lived at this period of time or that period of time, already found a bunch of biblical authors. So if you're into the ancient world, this might be right up your alley, a podcast of biblical proportions. Then I also have, as depicted on film, that I co-host with uh, Dr. Rutger Voss, with Rutger. Each time we pick a topic, And we review it through three film adaptations. For example, the deep sea as depicted on film. Christian pagans as depicted on film. We pick three films and through the depictions, we talk about the topic. It's a very, very cool format as depicted on film. So go and check out those two podcasts on every platform. So I think I'll see you here next week. Same time. Bye, everybody. Thank you for watching slash listening.